This is Designing the Revolution. It's the second add-on episode, The Political Problem. So before I start, um, I've been doing this podcast for about a year now, haven't I? And I started off in prison, then I broke my leg, so I was on my back for a few months. Then I've been getting better, and if you're wondering why, why I'm a bit horizontal, <laughs> it's because I walked down a hill and to cut a long story short, I sprained my good leg and now i am been in bed for a week trying to recover from that sprained leg. Anyway, I'm striding on and um, yes, what more can I say? All right, so in this episode we're going to look at the political problem and the purpose of these add-ons, as I explained last week, is I'm doing four episodes really to try and communicate that Revolutions all well and good, you know, fantastic idea, necessary, justified, um, inevitable. And at the same time, it's important not to fall into this sort of modern political trap of thinking that politics sorts everything out. There are what you might call perennial problems uh, of human existence, of human society, even of human politics. So I'm doing these add-ons really for you to think about okay, how can we respond to these? We're never, I'm going to suggest, I am suggesting that we're never going to solve them. Maybe we are, but they're pretty hard problems. And it's important to be consciously incompetent, as you might say, to be conscious of these and have a certain humility in responding to these problems, uh, rather than just charging ahead, thinking, oh, you know, we've sorted everything out when self-evidently we haven't. Um, Okay, so the political problem or the political question is goes along with a partner question which we dealt with last week, which was the social problem or the social question. And this is really the problem of inequality. And in its modern context, this is the problem of capitalism. But as we discussed, you know, capitalism is not the be-all, end-all of inequality. Inequality has been going on a long, long time, and it's been a major, major problem, um, you know, the rich and all the rest of it. And what we suggested is, yeah, there is a partial solution to this, which is state control of the economy, but that in itself creates unintended consequences. And then in response to that, we said, well, you know, maybe there's humanizing elements. You can use IT, you can use sociability designs to, to mitigate some of the problems that the state control of the economy. But that's, you know, that was a discussion. The whole purpose of these add-ons is not to go, hey, there you go, the solution. You know, the problem is is to go, all right, let's be conscious of what's going on. So there's a little bit of history going on here, as you might say, because in the history of revolutions, sometimes the social question is at the forefront and sometimes the political question is at the forefront. So the political question in you know, in a one sense sentence is who decides, you know, who's in control of the state, uh, how are decisions made, what's the structure of the constitution, all these sort of questions. So arguably up to 1848, the, the big question was the political question. You know, you had the divine right of kings, you had the aristocracy, you had these big movements demanding um, democratic control, one person, one vote, and such like going from the French Revolution up to the revolutions of 1848. In other words, they were sort of liberal in the sense that they were demanding, you know, human rights and they were demanding democratic assemblies as opposed to aristocratic rule. However, there was a crossover in 1848 when the emergence of the working class came along and they said, actually, we're not actually that bothered about who controls the government and democracy and all this stuff. I mean, they were. But the main thing was was not the political question, it was the social question, which was, hang on a minute, we're working, you know, our arse is off, we're getting no money, the capitalists are running off with all the cash. Uh, what we want is socialism, we want state control of the economy, we want regulation and such like. And then, you know, again, arguably, these are things aren't cut and dry, Arguably, from about 1945 onwards, there was a move, a gradual move back to the political question again. And this was partially because of Stalinism 
and you know the totalitarianism of left and right in the 20th century and people were saying you know yeah yeah you know we've got all our stuff now you know progress has been made but we're living in a totalitarian terror state why are these people ruling us what rights have we got why don't we have a voice why don't we have democracy etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you know just a final word here bringing us up to date this is all simplified <laughs> is um the neoliberal period from 1989 when both questions have come to the fore really the social question obviously because of the massive inequality of power but also there's a massive political question uh, political problem as we all know which is do democracies really have any power um, in an era when there's so much corporate corporate capture and there's globalization of the economy and people really don't feel they have control and obviously the ongoing story of corruption and the political class dominating uh, the social and political sphere and then added on to that of course we've got this you know massive climate crisis the final crisis as it were which is why we're doing these these episodes all right so something i just want to mention here as well is one of the big 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 problems with the old mechanical way of looking at politics is people will say and this is so prevalent even today people will say this is really bad and then we're going to have x socialism neoliberalism and then everything will be sorted out and they construct like a, a standard model of what socialism is or what communism is or what neoliberalism is and they go plonk there we go we've instituted a new regime this is bad <laughs> and one of the most exciting developments in sociology when I was young and I read about this and really impressed me was this notion of social reproduction in other words this notion that everyone gets up in the morning and they actually do recreate society they have agency and that each day is slightly different from the last day because everyone's reacting to what happened the day before in other words there's this intrinsic instability in any human system it's not a mechanical system basically everyone's responding to everyone else and you get these growing dysfunctions where people start responding in ways which are not good for the whole of society as you might say and you get what you might call degeneration or entropy and this is really the hard problem we're looking at in these add-on add uh, episodes. All right, so in the context of all of that, let's look at, um, at this political problem. You know, who rules and what's the justification for it and are they any good at ruling and all the rest of it. So the obvious, you know, two-minute answer is democracy historically. So as we've discussed, you know, there's been um, the autocracy of the monarchy and the aristocracy and a whole bunch of revolutions saying, no, we're going to have a democratic chamber, we're going to have a democratic institution, uh, constitution. And the fundamental name of the game is one person, one vote. As we know, it started off with rich men and then, you know, all men and then women and, and such like. And this is the modernist theory of the last 200 years if as you might say this is what modernity means but it's a problem so a major problem is elite capture so we see this over and over again and um, it's combined with this notion of demi what's it called demagogues right you know people like Trump coming along manipulating people and all the rest of it in other words, like Plato said, is, you know, democracy is not very good, just leads to tyranny because you get these people manipulating people or you get elite capture, you know, the rich and powerful dominating the ability to put your own candidates up. And, you know, you just need to look at the United States, for instance, in this respect. But there's also two other big, big problems with democracy 
uh, representational democracy. And we've discussed this, obviously, in the main episodes, but it's worth just repeating, is, is the problem is people have a limited amount of time to assess who they want to vote for. So the, it's not just a question of, hey, you can vote for who you want. It's also a question of time. If you haven't got much time, and of course if you're manipulated by a corporate-dominated um, media, then you can end up voting for things which are not well thought through because there's no time to deliberate, there's no time for accurate and diverse information to be given to you. And then the second problem, which is particularly dire due to the situation in the 21st century, is the short-termism of 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 democracy. In other words, politicians come into power and they... Uh, they're only thinking about the next election because that's that's what they're interested in. They're interested in power. And many, arguably, many of, of the key challenges of the 21st century require a long-term assessment, not least of, of threats. Um, and we know about all these threats, you know, the climate, the ecological stability of the planet and all this stuff. So... <clears throat> As you can see, the, the old idea, revolutionary idea is, oh, we create representational democracy and everything will be fine. It's just not working because there's a hard problem. There's a bunch of hard problems. So let's see a response to that. So the main response in this episode, this bunch of episodes on designing the revolution is there's a, there's a democracy 2.0, as you might say, and this, this rotates around the notion of citizens' assemblies. And we've spoken quite a lot about this, but I want to just go through it again and then pull it apart a bit, as you might say. So the citizens' assemblies paradigm of democracy is saying, look, having the right to vote is one aspect of democracy. It's not the whole of the democratic proposition. There's also who sets the agenda and the quality of the deliberation on the issues at hand. So the great thing about citizens' assemblies, in so much as they're great, is the sortition element, that people are selected by chance from the population, so the rich and powerful can't influence who gets into power. There's the rotation element, which is people don't stay in power for forever. They don't have um, they don't have careers. They're basically there to make good decisions. So you don't get people thinking, if I say this, if I promote this, I'll I'll stay in power, and they end up making a decision that's not rational, as you might say. And last but not least, deliberation, which is having enough time to discuss issues in depth, as I said, with a plurality of different sources, witnesses, you know, facts and figures, uh, free and open debate, as you might say. Okay, so that sounds great, doesn't it? Sounds great. However, the hard problem here is, is classically defined as who guards the guardians or who decides who decides. So although, although um, the citizens' assembly mechanism goes some way, if we define the problem as who decides who decides, that doesn't seem to be a problem because it just endlessly backs up on itself. So for instance, we can say, okay, we're going to have citizens' assemblies and then there's going to be a group of people who are going to organise this sortition process. So who organises the selection of the people who organise the sortition process? How do you get all these decisions to aggregate this together? Who decides how that happens? Who decides on who decides? Who decides on the constitution? So again, we've got like a soft solution to that, which is, yeah, we're going to have, you know, a bunch of, of responses about it. But if you see what I'm saying, you can always come back and go, or who decides about that, who guards the guardians. 
And this is not a small problem because of this degeneration situation, right? It's not like, hey, we've got this constitution of citizens' assemblies and it's going to be like that forever because in the entropy sort of idea, maybe 50, 100 years down the line, it's all start to fall to bits because it gradually degenerates. All right. There's another problem as well, which is a uniquely modern 21st century problem, which is to do with power and technology, which is in the good old days, before industrialization and what have you, people could only do so much. They could only affect things in their own particular time and space, you know, within their own country and a few years hence. In other words, they couldn't destroy the planet, to be blunt. They couldn't affect the quality of the next thousand generations. Um, <coughs> they couldn't destroy the uh, ecological systems themselves. They couldn't blow everything up. You see what I mean? So that raises a political problem, which is, okay, so everyone in the country is going to get together and they're going to decide in their collective interest, the common good, that's all good. But by definition, it's only people who are going to be alive. So how do you account for the rights of the people that haven't been born? How do you account for the rights of animals? How do you account for the rights of the planetary system? Because of this massive increase in technological power. All right. So dare I say it, there is not, in my humble opinion, <laughs> a final solution. But I just want to go through, you know, some of the responses to this, just to get your juices going, as it were, for over the next few decades. So that at least you know where the discussion and the debate is. And you never know, maybe you're going to come up with something more sophisticated. So I'm talking here, you know, to mainly some of the younger people listening to this because it's important, as I said, number one, to realise this revolutionary project is not, it's not, that's it. There's a whole bunch of continuing and um, perennial problems, as I've said. All right, so let's have a final stab at the situation. So we started off with democracy, you know, representation on democracy, great. Turns out that's not that great. Then we're doing the main show, citizens' assemblies. Yeah, pretty good, but still are some major problems. So let's have our third stab. So first of all, a lot of the devil is in the detail with these citizens' assembly constitutions. In other words, each element of it could degenerate. So for instance, we've got the implementation problem, right, which is sometimes called the agent principal problem. So if some people make a decision on behalf of the people, all well and good, nice and rational, and then other people have to obviously go off and implement it. And those people, dare I say, have their own interests. Um, and they manipulate the implementation of the policy, according to that ideology, or according to their greed, or various sort of dysfunctionalities. So you could say, okay, we've got citizens' assemblies, that's great, and then we hand it over to the bureaucrats and the uh, small the business people and the civil service to implement them. And surprise, surprise, they sabotage it. So a so more sophisticated design is, is you have an implementation process which is transparent so everyone can see it, and half the people on the implementation committees are selected by sortition from the population. So there's, you know, Mr. Jones, electrician, sitting on the implementation committee and the civil service guy goes, well, you know, I, I think this decision wasn't very good and we're going to change it around. And he says, excuse me, it's not for you to change it around. It's, it's, it is what it is and you've got to implement it. So again, you know, that's a good bit of sophisticated design, but it's not foolproof, right? <laughs> it's, it's good. Uh, but a final solution to this, or uh, a solution is to make your design sophisticated. 
um, a last example is, you know, there is going to be rotation. There is going to be crises, right? There's always crises. So instead of the whole thing collapsing under the weight of an external crisis, you have some some process of a partial suspension of the constitution. So a few people can get on and actually make the decisions that need to be rapidly made and need to be really rapidly impl imp implemented. Um, and so if, it, if there's a constitutional arrangement for that, there's a constitutional arrangement for bringing it back so it doesn't degenerate into a long-term dictatorial system. And there's plenty of historical examples of that. You can see this in ancient Rome, for instance. So again, you're thinking, great, you know, I mean, for hundreds of years, Rome didn't have an autocracy. And that's because it had this flexibility in the system. It was sophisticated. But as you can see, it, you know, it's not foolproof. And it wasn't foolproof in ancient Rome, for instance. OK, so the other, the other response to it is constant vigilance which is a bit wet, <laughs> but it's sort of saying, look, you know, throwing the towel, you are not going to be able to design the structure for a permanent utopia. It's going to degenerate a, perma a, a perfect constitution. Or the actual act of knowing it's imperfect and you have to be under constant vigilance is and of itself a primary mechanism of making sure that it doesn't fall into disrepair. In other words, if you have a, a sort of hubristic um, perfectionism, utopianism, then you get all egotistical if someone goes, actually, it's not working very well. If you have a culture of what you more, might call conscious incompetence, look, this constitution, it's great, but it's not, it's not going to be there forever. We need to constantly assess it. And there's a structural process for that. Then the argument is it's the act of seeing and the act of analysis, which is the best way of making sure the thing doesn't all collapse into a mess. And that connects really with the third thing, which is even more sort of abstract in a way. It's not about design, design a constitution type stuff. It's actually looking at what the underlying dynamic of degeneration is. And the underlying dynamic is the pursuit of power, arguably. In other words, underlying the problem of politics, the problem of who decides who decides, is the idea that some people want to decide, and they want to decide in order to increase their power and privilege and wealth. And the proposition here is that that is a cultural variable through history. What I mean by that is there's periods of history and there's cultures where people are encultured into being mad about power and strength and all this sort of stuff. And then there's other cultures where, you know what, people just want to live a normal life and just have rituals and religion and sociability and, you know, if someone wants to run the village, that's fine. But no one's really trying to create some pathological, hierarchical, bollocks system. Right? <laughs> and that's quite a powerful anthropological, you know, observation. There are societies where, yeah, there's hierarchy and there's politics, obviously. There's always that to a certain extent. But really, you know, it's not the only game in town, as you might say. So there is a literature saying... The reason, for instance, that the tragedy of the commons doesn't work, you know, this idea that everyone's got their cows, there's common land and everyone, everyone's out for their own self-interest and everyone puts their cows on the common land and the common land degenerates but there's nothing you can do about it because everyone's pursuing their individual self-interest, you know, that, that model. Actually, historically, as a matter of historical observation, it doesn't happen. And you know it doesn't happen because... If it was as simple as that, the whole of human society would have collapsed long ago. And instead, you've got this, this cultural thing where people get together and they're not that mad about having more cows. What they want is the social 
connection of being in a village where everyone respects the common interest and more especially this is reinforced by a culture and a tradition a historical tradition where everyone doesn't go onto the common land everyone respects that common land and it's the power of that tradition that gives people their identity not the possession of extra power and cattle and all the rest of it and that's under underlying that is this notion of religion and spirituality and what it actually means to be who you are and that's a whole new area of discussion and I'm going to come to this on the last episode so I'm going to leave it at that so as I said these add-ons are they're more like questions they're informed questions so instead of this whole load of episodes finishing off with, you know, Roger Hallam finishes his complete analysis of the world. It's not like that, right? It's more like, here you go, here's an iteration, it's good enough to go. And here's a bunch of reasons why what I'm saying is pretty problematic. <laughs> and you're just going to have to work at it uh, potentially forever because we're dealing with official hard problems. So there we go. We'll go into alienation next. I'll see you next time.